Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When we hold a funeral, the family and the loved ones and, and, and the clergy gather on the grave, and usually that clergy person will say something like, Lord, we commit this loved one's body to you, knowing that one day you will raise it up again. Now, that's not just a promise for God's people, but for every person. And take a look at the passage that tells us this truth. Daniel 12 is a key chapter because it gives us the timeline of God's final program for mankind. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 12 together here. Now, as we get into this passage here, by way of context, we need to remember that yesterday we were looking at Daniel chapter 10 when an unnamed angelic being gave Daniel this final vision that spans from chapters 10 through 12. Now, we skipped over chapter 11, but it contains an in-depth prophecy of Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled from 175 BC to 164 BC. Now, as chapter 11 came to a close, kind of like almost like a, a bomber airplane taking off from a runway, it suddenly lifts its gaze up to the end of time. The end of chapter 11 just starts looking past just the near future, which is still yet to come, but then to the far future, and just speaks of this global warfare that's going to break on out, and it sets up chapter 12 with the final tribulation. Now, let's just pause for a moment before we keep on going Daniel 12 and just talk about the prophecy that's all throughout this book. This prophecy is so accurate that sometimes people who don't believe the Bible will say, well, this is just too accurate. I mean, that's obviously so, obviously Antiochus Epiphanes. He, there's no way that a prophet could have written these things with that kind of detail beforehand. So this must have been written after the fact. But if we had gone through chapter 11, we would also see, although it's incredible detail about what was still to come, it then kind of starts saying things that have yet to come, speaking of the final kingdom and, and the, just the final culmination of world events. And the question would be asked, if this was all written after the fact and somebody was not really Daniel, it's kind of faking it and saying, I see this and I see that, when really just talking about the past. If that was really the case, then why take that swerve into things that have not happened yet? And why do it in such a way where it's really hard to even differentiate or distinguish who, what, we're, what events we're talking about? Was this the near event that was going to be fulfilled in Tychus Epiphanies? Or is this going to be the far event that's fulfilled the end times? And that back and forth interplay there, and the fact that a lot of the prophecies haven't happened yet, there's no way that a false prophet would have done that because then he would be just discrediting himself. The reason why they're all folded together, because this is how prophecy is written. It combines these near events and these future events. And we're really looking forward to that ultimate day at the end times when all of these things are wrapped on up and zipped on up with the detail that we're seeing here in this passage. So going back to chapter 12 here, chapter 11 ends looking forward to the end times. And that's where picking things up in chapter 12. And chapter 12 is answering the question, when? When will these things happen? And this chapter gives us such incredible detail of the final events of God's program. So let's look at chapter 12 and unpack when these events will occur, starting in verse 1. Verse 1 opens with the words, Now at that time. And this points to the final section of chapter 11 when the Antichrist rises up during the final tribulation. And verse 1 says that this will be the time of distress that is unlike anything the world has ever seen. Now, you think about it. In the last century, we've seen the Holocaust. We've seen genocide in Africa. We've seen a lot of bad stuff. But this will be worse than any of that. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, says this will be a time of Jacob's distress. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8, tells us that only a third of the Jews will survive this time. Jesus describes this as a time of distress in Matthew 24. And this whole period is what we typically call the tribulation. And the final three and a half years we're going to be talking about in just a minute, that's specifically called the great tribulation. And so the whole thing is a tribulation. And that second half, that great tribulation, is when things get really bad. And yet verse 1 also tells us that anyone's name who has written in the book of life will be rescued. Now, what is this book that's being spoken about here? This is the book of life that we really haven't talked about much before, but it occurs throughout the scriptures. For instance, it's spoken of back in Exodus 32, verse 32, Psalm 56, 8, later on in Malachi 3, 16, and in several places in the book of Revelation. And so God has written a list of those who will be saved from his wrath. This is basically an eternal ledger of the heavenly citizenship. It is a list of those who are permanently enrolled in heaven. And at the last judgment in Revelation 20, verse 15, these books will be opened, and anyone whose name is not written in the book of life will be thrown in the lake of fire. And going on to verse 2, a verse 2 seems to indicate that at the same time that those who will be rescued are actually being rescued, that those who have already died, whose, whose names are written in the book of life, They'll be rescued from the grave too, and they will all together be gathered together and brought in with one giant kind of grand entrance into the new kingdom that Daniel's been telling us about, really going all the way back to chapter 2 of this book. 
And so when that kingdom is established, when that coming kingdom, that new kingdom is established, they will be populated by the people whose names are written in the book of life, and they will be coming from the great tribulation or from the grave, all entering into that messianic kingdom. Now, if you look at verse 2, it also talks about another resurrection, a resurrection of judgment, where everyone's name who has not written the book of life will, will be resurrected, and they'll enter a state of disgrace and everlasting contempt. In other words, they'll be entering into hell. Now, it's commonly pointed out now, and it's not really obvious just by looking at verse 2, but there's two resurrections being spoken of here. And the first resurrection in verse 2, this is that blessed resurrection. That's at the beginning of the millennial kingdom as all of God's people enter into that millennial kingdom. And the second resurrection we know is a resurrection of judgment. And we know from Revelation chapter 20 that that occurs at the end of the millennial kingdom here. And so we want to be a part of the first resurrection because that's where God's people enter his millennial kingdom. And the second resurrection no one from that resurrection actually gets into heaven. At that point, if you're in the second resurrection, you're really bound for hell. Now, going on to verse 3. In verse 3, those who have been faithfully following the word of God and leading others to righteousness will shine like stars forever. This is just a beautiful promise because back in chapter 11, verse 33, these same people kind of describes the same way. We didn't look at this passage, but the same people describe the same way. They're going to be killed by sword and flame and plunder. Like they're going to be like executed and burned alive and just robbed and stolen from. And even though they are killed during this time, their eternity, their eternal state is not finished. They will be resurrected to a new life and the victory that is theirs in Christ. So that's just a beautiful promise in verse 3. And these first three verses just cover a lot of ground, but we're not even close to being done with chapter 12 here. So let's go on to verse 4 here. Verse 4 is just an injunction to Daniel to seal up these words. This doesn't mean like lock them on up so nobody has access to them. The other way around, take care of them. Treat them like they are the words of the king that they are. Preserve them. Make sure they're carefully written down for all mankind to have and to know. And so seal these up, Daniel. And that's what he does, of course. Well, going on in the rest of this passage here, verses 5 to 7 remind us that we're actually not just reading a straight prophecy. We're reading a narrative that Daniel is giving to us of a vision that he is having. And so remember, he's having this whole vision where they're by the Tigris River. He and a bunch of other guys, now the guys ran off. So Daniel's having this vision alone here. And here he's got this unnamed angelic being who's just talking to him, laying out this whole prophecy. And he's got this other being, this fiery being, this hovering above the waters. And we said yesterday that I, and really many conservative Bible scholars, would say that that's just Jesus. That's a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus. And so now here in verses 5 to 7, you have this situation where we're back again. We're back into the, like looking at these two beings here. And the unnamed angelic being looks at the fiery being. And he asked the question in verse 6. He says, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? Basically, okay, so we've just laid this on out. Now, when will this happen? Or what will be the end of this? How long till the end of all of these things? And that just shows us that even the angels who are unfolding these revelations to Daniel, they're not omnipotent. They don't have everything all worked on out. And so he looks at this other one who would be again Jesus, who is in authority, and Jesus then raises his hands in answer. So in verse 7, he raises both of his hands, which is probably just a way of signifying the solemnity of this moment, this oath of this moment. And he says it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, that all of these events will be completed. And so when will the prophecies that we've just been speaking about come to an end? Well, at a time, times, and half a time. Now, what's that? Well, if you've been going through this study with us, then you know we've already talked about this back in chapter 7, verse 25. It uses the same wording there. It says time, time, and half a time. And we've just been saying and seeing that this is speaking of a three and a half year period of time. And so time being one year, times being two year, half a time being a half a year. And so the seven year tribulation is divided into two halves. The first half, three and a half years. The second half, three and a half years. That's going to be a lot clearer when we get down to verses 11 and 12 here. Now, in terms of all these events here, the resurrection here, the judgment, the return of Christ, uh, which of these halves will experience all of these things? Well, if the first half were to experience that, the first three and a half years, that would be implying that all of these events will be coming halfway through the tribulation. And that doesn't really make sense that you'd have all of this stuff completed before all of this stuff is completed. It just doesn't even make sense logically. And so we can surmise here that all of that's going to happen in the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation, the final three and a half years. Now, having said that, verses 11 and 12 give us more precision about the timing of what's to come. If you look at verse 11, it says, From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Now, if you took 1,290 days and divided it by 365 days that would be in a calendar year, 
you end up with just over three and a half years. Again, remember, Jewish calendars are a little bit different. So basically three and a half years. And verse 11 is saying that when sacrifices are abolished and when the abomination of desolation occurs, there will now be another three and a half years before the Lord returns. Now that may cause us to ask the question, well, okay, if that's what's going to kick off the final three and a half years, when does that happen? It's actually been already said in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. If you turn your Bibles back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, here's what it says. And it says, He, that would be the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. Now we'll stop right there. And we're just seeing here that halfway through this tribulation, the Antichrist stops the sacrifices, and that launches the final half a week, the final three and a half days, or the Great Tribulation. And so from that point on, you got three and a half more years before the Messiah returns and establishes his new kingdom. And it'll be so hard and be such a reward for those who wait that verse 12 says, how blessed is the one who keeps waiting and attains the 1,335 days. Now, if you're a math person, you might be like, wait a minute, wait, wait, hang on. Verse 11 says it's going to be 1,290 days. Now, verse 12 says it's going to be 1,335 days. That's a 45-day difference. What gives? Well, the additional days are probably to allow for the transition between the return of Christ and the establishment of the millennial kingdom. You got the things like the sheep and goat judgment you see in Matthew 25. So all of that's going to occur um, at that same period of time during that time. Now, uh, all of this has given us the last seven years of this age of mankind. When you think about what Daniel has said to us in these chapters we've been studying so far, going back to Daniel chapter 2, all the way here to Daniel chapter 12, we started out with just Nebuchadnezzar and the, the Babylonian reign and Daniel's day. We've gone through the various kings, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, Antiochus Epiphanes, the revised Roman Empire, now the Antichrist and the end times, and finally the return of Christ. And we're seeing here that all of this, when these things happen, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised when there is something of a revised Roman Empire coming back on the scene, maybe not called that way, but has that same kind of system, power, authority, dominion over the earth. When that comes on, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised when a temple is rebuilt in Israel so they can begin their sacrifices again. We shouldn't be surprised. And as we see these things unfolding, we know that God's agenda and God's plan is being worked out before our eyes. Now, with all of this here, we don't know fully when these things are becoming to an end. But we know that when anyone comes to Christ, they become part of his people. Their names are in the book of life. And with all these things going on here, uh, the Jews at this time will be followers of Christ in the tribulation as well. Or at least that there'll be that revival going on and those with insight will be pointing people to the Messiah. And with all that going on, we know that the Messiah is coming back to establish his kingdom. He made a covenant with the Jews so long ago, he will be faithful to that covenant. And if you're not Jewish, but you're a follower of Christ, he's including you, be a part of that covenant as well. And that kingdom is coming to be established where righteousness and his word and his ways will just be how we live and, and how we function. And we'll just enjoy the peace and grace and joy that just comes from walking with him and obeying him. And so in all of this here, this just brings us to a couple questions. Again, there is coming a day of resurrection. For God's people, it will be a resurrection before the millennial kingdom where they enter that millennial kingdom. And it will be a resurrection of joy and reward and just, just such excitement as we enter in that kingdom. After a thousand years, God's enemies will be also resurrected. They too will be resurrected. But their resurrection will be a resurrection of, of shame and contempt and judgment. And they'll be thrown in the lake of fire. And so the question for all of us, all of us listening, I know sometimes families are listening or maybe even friends or coworkers are listening. The question for all of us to ask today is, if you were to die today, one, first, no, you will be resurrected one day. You have no choice about that. No matter what side you are on, you'll be resurrected. But when you are resurrected, which resurrection would be a part of? That of life to kingdom to joy or that of death and sorrow and, and just, just grief and pain? Now, if you're not sure, you can settle that right now. Uh, just to be a part of Christ's people, it just begins by calling upon him confessing our sins, recognizing him as Lord. Remember, he's making a covenant. This is all one big covenant. He's offering us a covenant where he'll be our king, we'll be his people. Accept the covenant. Accept the payment for your sins. Accept the forgiveness he offers you. And then embrace that and just become a child of his, a person of his kingdom. And then just get to know your king by walking with him, praying with him, reading his word, gathering with his people, living out kingdom principles, being one of the insightful people back in verse 3 who is just pointing people to Jesus, and then just living out your life in fellowship with him, putting your trust, and maybe in our own lifetime, he will come back. 
Well, we'll end on that. And just if you've been going through all these series, all these podcasts on the book of Daniel, thanks so much. It has been so great to go through this book together with you. Thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for listening in. Have a great rest of your day. God bless.